Gracious God, may the word you would have us hear this day slip into our soul. Amen. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Go at once to Nineveh and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah found a ship going to Tarshish, away from Nineveh. So God hurled a mighty storm upon the sea. That the sh it was so mighty that the ship threatened to break up. The mariners were afraid, and each one cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and was fast asleep. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lots fell to Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is it that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from God. Then they said to him, What shall we do so that the sea may quiet down? And Jonah said, Throw me into the sea. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. But God provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah went to Nineveh, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. Then the king gave a proclamation. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw how they had turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had set to bring upon them. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning? For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And now, O oh Lord, just take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Should I not be concerned about the people of Nineveh, in which there are 120,000 people who do not know their left hand from their right? This is the word of the Lord. Students from the Middle East who were living in the Boston area were participating in a dialogue workshop. Two young men, an Israeli Jew and a Palestinian Christian, were arguing about the way Palestinians were treated when they attempted to cross the border from the West Bank into Israel. While they argued, a Palestinian woman named Rahima sat nearly motionless and listened. Her Palestinian friend became frustrated and said to the Israeli, If you think we're not treated like dirt at the checkpoints, then dress up like an Arab and see what happens to you when you try to cross. The argument continued, going back and forth, and the facilitator was just about to intervene when Rahima spoke up. The room became quiet. She looked at the Israeli and without any judgment in her voice said, 
I can see that you are having trouble believing my friend. Let me tell you a story that may help convey what he's trying to say. When I was six years old, my grandfather told me that we were going over to the old city in Jerusalem to see a friend that he'd not seen in many years. I remembered thinking that my grandfather was quite old and he might be thinking this was the final time he would see his friend. The thought made me very sad because I loved my grandfather. He was a prominent member of the community in Ramallah. Everyone respected him. People young and old would come to him for advice. He was the unofficial mediator. I was so proud to be his granddaughter. When we approached the border crossing, a young Israeli soldier ordered my grandfather out of the car, and I became terrified. At one point, I saw my grandfather trying to explain something to the soldier, but the soldier started yelling at him and accusing him of lying. I couldn't believe it. Even though I was six years old, I jumped out of the car, I ran up to the soldier. Don't you know who this is? As she recalled this humiliating incident, the tears began to flow, and finally she just put her head into her hands and sobbed. Everyone in the workshop waited quietly. Then the Israeli said he was very sorry to hear that she and her grandfather were forced to endure such indignity. His voice began to tremble as he explained that it was difficult for him to hear her story. He said, as an Israeli, I believe in my heart that we are good people, fighting a just cause to maintain our Jewish identity and the future of Judaism. I feel the righteousness of our cause if I accept what you say that we fight in a way that is profoundly harming to you and your people, then it forces me to look at my own identity and ask, who am I? What am I doing? I must swallow a bitter truth. The way I have constructed my identity up to this point is causing great suffering. There may be no greater existential crisis than when we are forced to look at ourselves in the full light of day, exposing not merely our honorable attributes, but also our prejudices, not only our virtues, but also our contempt for people from other tribes. Now the book of Jonah has often been mischaracterized as a tale for children. It's been presented in a Pinocchio-like story about a man who was swallowed by a whale and after three days of pondering his predicament, the fish unceremoniously belched him onto the shore. The point of the story is not a supernatural miracle that somehow Jonah was kept alive amid the krill and crustaceans, but rather how sparingly we draw the circle of God's mercy. Now Jonah is unlike any Hebrew prophet. The other prophets served as a mouthpiece of God, delivering a challenging message to the people. Jonah was an insubordinate who tried to cut and run. All of the other prophets were historical figures. The book of Jonah is literary satire. Practically everything in the story is overdone, exaggerated, both to amuse and to drive home its central point. 
Now, much of Scripture is pretty serious and sobering, but the spinner of this tale used humor to disarm his listeners so that they might hear the message that countered their natural instinct. The book of Jonah begins like most prophetic books. God calls Jonah to communicate the divine will. However, unlike the other prophets, Jonah is not called to address the Hebrew people. Instead, God commands Jonah to go to the Israelites' arch enemy, the Assyrians. Jonah is summoned to go to their capital city of Nineveh and to call on them to repent of their wickedness. But Jonah wants no part of it. Why? Not because he's hesitant to castigate the Assyrians. He would relish the chance to lambast them for their depravity. Then why is it that Jonah wants to weasel out of his assignment? It's because Jonah does not want to risk the possibility, however remote, that the people might actually heed his call. Because if they repent, he knows that God will forgive them. And that's the worst possible scenario, according to Jonah. So when God dials up Jonah and commands him to go to Nineveh, Jonah hops on a ship heading in the opposite direction. Of course, it's ludicrous to imagine that you can somehow flee from God. You can run and run, but you cannot hide. The hound of heaven will track you down. In Jonah's case, this entailed God whipping up a violent storm that threatened to capsize their ship. Jonah, feeling guilty about the ship's crew possibly being thrown into a watery grave, fesses up. He tells the sailors, throw him into the ocean. He would rather drown than fulfill his assignment. However, rather than being engulfed by the waters, he is gulped by a big fish. Entombed in darkness for three days, Jonah begins to pray. He prays that God will deliver him from this darkness. And God answers his prayer. However, once Jonah is spewed onto the shore, he discovers that God has had him delivered to the outskirts of Nineveh. You have to love God's sense of humor. <laughs> After such a harrowing experience, we might expect Jonah to change his tune, to become a zealot, enthusiastic to carry out the will of God. However, Jonah is a reluctant prophet. He fears God will be merciful to his enemy, so he does the absolute bare minimum. His prophetic message to the Ninevites? One measly sentence. Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. And yet, that's all it takes. Jonah's worst nightmare is realized. The people repent. God forgives them. Jonah's incensed because he thinks God is way too soft, too understanding, way too forgiving. Does God not comprehend how terrible those people are? Some of the writings of the Old Testament reveal a narrow nationalism in which the Hebrew people are valued as the chosen people of God and everyone else is something far less. On too many occasions, this nationalistic zeal served as a justification for slaughtering their adversaries. The book of Jonah was written as a counter voice. God is creator of heaven and earth, and therefore every person is a child of God. Of course, Jonah is not the only such voice. Isaiah also declares that 
two of the staunchest enemies of Israel will one day become their allies. It's very easy for us to slip into a way of thinking that imagines that our adversaries are God's adversaries. It can be very demanding to view someone unlike yourself as a child of God. It's far easier to make them into a cardboard cutout that we can mock and disdain. I think the book of Jonah is a timely piece we need to take to heart. Within our own nation and around the globe, there are nationalistic movements that seek to draw stark dividing lines between us and them. Political leaders adroitly tap into people's fear of the other to promote division and to garner support for themselves. The book of Jonah counters nationalistic tendencies. It does not claim that if you simply give people the opportunity, everyone will make nice with each other. It does not declare that the Assyrians were destined to come clear, to come clean. In fact, they might have told Jonah to go back to his people and tell the Hebrew people, the Assyrian army is on the march and they'll sweep through you like a wildfire scorching the earth. The book of Jonah does not urge us to turn a blind eye to lies and greed and abuses of power and violence. God's command to do justice requires us to resist those who have gone over to the dark side. What the book of Jonah does is warn against the danger of imagining that God is only on our side and not the side of our adversary. Because if that's the case, the ends justify the means, and vilifying those outside of our tribe is perfectly acceptable. While tribalism is having a strong showing these days, there's another spirit also blowing through the world. Many have a growing awareness that the things that divide us do not possess the same power as the things that unite us. Our world is changing in terms of interfaith relationships. When the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center killed over 4,000 people, some blamed all Muslims and Islamic law. Hate crimes ensued. Some Christian leaders refused to participate in services where a Muslim was present. However, the long-term effect of 9-11 seems to be the opposite. People from religious back, different religious backgrounds have worked to better understand each other, to recognize what we share in common, and to form friendships. Christians now participate in Ramadan iftar dinners. Muslims go to Jewish Shabbat services. Jews come to Christian worship. There's a growing appreciation of one another's faiths and the basic principles we all hold in common. Treating others the way we want to be treated is the path of many. On Friday, September 17th, Sadiq Dalival, father of three, and the first deputy sheriff in Houston from the Sikh community made a routine traffic stop. He had no idea that the person he pulled over was a violent criminal. As the deputy walked back to his patrol car, the criminal ran up behind him and shot him twice in the head. He was airlifted to the hospital, but he did not survive. The response of the people of Houston was overwhelming. Rather than reverting to their own tribes, people of all faiths started setting up many memorials all over the vast city. On the Tuesday following his death, 
the local franchise of Papa John's Pizza said they would donate all their profits to the family. The response was so overwhelming, some waiting in line for three hours, that they decided to extend the offer through Friday. In between football practices, one of the Houston Texans would go to the Papa John's and help make pizzas. One of the players for the Astros gave the family $10,000. On the day of the memorial service, the local CBS affiliate suspended all local programming and instead focused on all things about the Sikh community and the service. That started at 7 a.m. in the morning and continued until the hearse pulled away at 1.30 that afternoon. The crowd that attended the service was estimated over 10,000. They represented every race and every religion. Numerous dignitaries were there who attended. There was a law enforcement officer from every state in the country. Prophetic spirituality summons us to lean into God's dream of putting people before prejudice, extending kindness rather than surrendering to fear, and seeking the common good rather than drawing lines in the sand. May we always remember that God is not a local deity who favors one tribe against the others, but rather the creator of all that is, who beckons us, who challenges us, who pleads with us to seek peace on earth.